Uh, so we're going to go to our third and final panel on. So any sort of uh, pent up questions you have, if you've been sort of pondering, uh, you're going to have to ask them in this session whether they're ready to answer them or not. Uh, they will be. But we, we still have some other folks here who presented earlier. So uh, any additional questions, make sure you get them out during this session. Um, I don't have any other plugs, so I'm going to turn it over to Krista Bauman from our finance department who will uh, lead this third and final session. Okay, thanks and welcome for being here. Um, my name is Krista Bauman, I'm in the banking and finance department. Uh, in a prior life, I worked at ABN Emerald Bank. And it's actually quite remarkable when I think back to the history of that bank, or at least what happened to it in the past few years. About a year and a half ago, it was in the news because it was um, the target of a hostile takeover bid in banking, which is very unheard of. And it actually was sold to a consortium of three banks, and it was like the biggest merger, or the biggest acquisition, I should say, um, worldwide ever, with a price of close to $100 billion. Uh, and like so many other banks, also, um, the different parts of ABN Amro Bank uh, got into uh, trouble over the, uh, during the crisis. So for example, the Dutch, Belgian, Luxembourg uh, part, which was bought by uh, Fortis, uh, needed an injection from the governments of those uh, three countries combined. And actually, uh, recently, the Dutch government decided to nationalize, completely nationalize the Dutch part. So it's now government-owned, and that's my former employer. So quite, uh, quite remarkable. What I would like to do uh, today is uh, three things. Uh, talk to you briefly about uh, Freddie uh, and Fanny. We've already talked about it. There are a few things that I would just like to highlight. Also a little bit about moral hazard problems, and uh, a little bit about uh, banking laws. So Freddie and Fanny, I'll, I have two slides on Freddie and Fanny. I'll keep it brief because we have discussed it uh, in part uh, before. But I think it's useful to know a little bit about the history of these uh, two organizations. So they're both government-sponsored entities. Uh, Fanny is the oldest of the two. It was created in 1938 to stimulate home ownership in the US. And actually in 1968, it was uh, privatized. Uh, why? Well, the government needed money, okay? So the government decided to privatize it, and then it realized, well, probably it's good to actually create some, um, some competition for Fannie, so let's actually create a Freddie Mac uh, as well. So that's uh, why Freddie Mac was created in, uh, in 1970. Now, initially, both of them were actually quite small, and it wasn't until the 1980s, when we had the savings and loan crisis, that actually both of them uh, started to become really big. But during the savings and loan crisis, uh, there were a lot of savings and loans that were in trouble. You know, what does a savings and loan do? Well, it takes in deposits, and in essence, it gives out mortgages. Okay, so a lot of them actually uh, went under, and in this period, Freddie and Fannie actually uh, gained a lot of uh, market share. Then in the 70s, as you know, banks started to secure these mortgages, like uh, Peter already uh, indicated. So rather than keeping mortgages uh, on their books, banks would basically um, try to securitize them, and initially they did that through uh, Freddie and uh, Fannie. Now, originally, what Freddie and Fannie would buy uh, were basically the conforming loans, also called the prime loans. So these are the loans, they had to meet three criteria. So on the one hand, uh, lo these loans were made to uh, borrowers with, with relatively high credit scores. Also, it debt to income ratio had to be less than 45%, so they would simply take all of your debt and divide it by <coughs> your gross income, and that could not exceed 45%. And also, the loan to value ratio, so the mortgage divided by the value of your house could not exceed 90%. So these were actually you know, mortgages to people that had a high likelihood uh, of being able to repay their, uh, their mortgages. Now, more recently, they also started to buy and securitize these riskier loans that uh, Peter uh, talked about, the subprime loans, 
and the alt A loans. So the difference between the two is that the alt A loans, those are the, the loans with incomplete documentation. So a lot of times there would be no income verification. You know, you would knock on the door of the bank and you would say, well, right now, you know, I don't have a job, but hey, I'm interviewing. And the bank said, oh, that's good enough. Let's give you a mortgage. Okay, so those were the alt A uh, loans. And the subprime loans, well, they were actually loans to uh, borrowers with relatively poor uh, credit history. So the probability of them repaying even if you know, the market is doing well, uh, was uh, already uh, lower. Now, everything might still have been okay for Freddie and Penny if they uh, had simply decided to stick to securitizing these mortgages, but they said at some point, hey, you know, we can actually make more money ourselves if we also invest in these securities. So they started to not just securitize them, but they also started to invest in these alt A loans and also in these uh, uh, subprime uh, mortgages. And that's why they needed a bailout from the government, because when the crisis hit, uh, these were the mortgages that uh, were in trouble. Moral hazard uh, problems. Uh, Peter already uh, talked about uh, moral hazard um, faced by banks when they securitize uh, loans. What I would like to talk about uh, is um, two moral hazard problems that are like the, the classic moral hazard problems in, uh, in banking. Well, what is moral hazard? It's like, well, if you're insulated from, uh, from risk, you have a tendency to take more risk. One classic problem is the too big to fail policy. So banks, if they are too big, like if you have a, a city group, it is costly to let a bank like that fail because um, the repercussions in the payment system are huge. Okay? If a small commercial bank fails, uh, it's almost like who cares? Okay? If a small, bank, uh, small commercial bank fails, uh, it won't give a ripple effect. But if a large bank like a city corp, if it were to fail, um, a lot of other people in different parts of the country who have deposited their money at different banks would think, oh wow, you know, if Citicorp can fail, let me actually pull out my money out of my bank. And then you get uh, the kind of bank run that also Justin uh, was uh, talking about. So on the one hand, it's good that we have these, I guess, we, that we have these too big to fail policies, but it's also good that there are only a few large banks that are actually, that actually fall under uh, this uh, umbrella, uh, even though we've seen in the current crisis that uh, the too big to fail policy, which originally only applied to commercial banks, has also been extended now to investment uh, banks. Um, the good thing is that we can prevent some of these uh, bank runs from, from happening, but at the same time, you do know that um, the banks that fall under this protection, that they will have an incentive to take more, uh, more risk. Also, deposit insurance also gives uh, bank, banks an incentive to take more uh, risk. The good thing about deposit insurance is that you and I, when we go to the bank and we deposit our money, that we you know, can sleep well at night because we know that you know, whatever happens with the bank, as long as we don't have uh, more than $100,000 uh, in deposits at one particular uh, bank, or these days 250,000, uh, it's basically uh, guaranteed. But the bad thing is that it gives banks an incentive to take more risk. Why is that? Well, compare a bank with, say, a regular corporation. A regular corporation, when it needs financing, well, it uses debt and it uses equity. Typically, for debt, it goes to a bank, or you know, it may issue bonds. It will, there will be a bank and there will be bondholders that actually monitor the activities of the firm. In case of a bank, if you have um, 70 or 80 percent of your financing coming from insured deposits, well, we're not going to monitor the activities of the bank. Given that there's far less monitoring, it's important to um, actually um, impose capital requirements. And that's exactly why we do have capital requirements for commercial banks. Because absent capital requirements, banks have an incentive to take far too much risk 
and at least by imposing capital requirements, we can make sure that, hey, if a bank engages in riskier activities, they have to hold more capital. Well, even with these uh, capital requirements in place, at commercial banks, you know, a typical commercial bank will have maybe 10% uh, equity, which you know, compared to a regular uh, corporation is, uh, is low, but at least it's a lot higher than uh, the capital that a lot of these investment banks uh, hold, like uh, Scott indicated, only like 3%. Okay, so the last issue I would like to touch a little bit uh, upon is banking, uh, banking laws. And I have just listed two of them that uh, have come up in debates uh, quite regularly. The first one is Glass-Steagall. Um, it was enacted in period 1933-1935, uh, so around the time of the Great Depression. And it actually required uh, commercial banks and investment banks to basically separate their activities. So for many decades, that was uh, the way uh, we did things uh, here in the US. Commercial banks could not engage in investment banking activities and vice versa. <coughs> Then in 1999, we had Graham Leach-Bliley, and basically it's, um, it, was, it meant the end of Glass-Steagall because all at once commercial banks were allowed to also engage in investment banking activities and also uh, in insurance uh, activities. And the first famous example is you know, Citigroup merging with uh, travelers. Okay, that actually happened right before this. They were actually pushing to get this law enacted because they wanted to merge. Now, recently we've seen that there's a rush to uh, becoming uh, a bank holding company. Uh, two of the last, well, we used to have five uh, standalone investment banks. There are only two of them uh, left, and they already indicated they, that they want to become an, uh, a bank holding company. Also, American Express, the last independent credit card company. Uh, recently got approval to become a bank holding company, and even uh, some of the other finance companies like uh, GMAC and also uh, General Electric's uh, financial subsidiary, they are contemplating uh, whether they may become a bank holding company uh, themselves as well. Now, why do they want to become a bank holding company? Well, there are several advantages uh, for these institutions. Uh, right now, the way they finance themselves, or the way they used to finance themselves in the past, was through commercial paper. Peter to uh, talked a little bit about this. Commercial paper, what is it? You can really compare it to a short-term loan. It's just that the money doesn't come from the bank, but it comes from investors. And when that market dried up because investors were less willing to provide financing, all at once the financing cost uh, increased incredibly. And here I have an example, uh, American Express, uh, they used to pay LIBOR, which is the moment in the interbank offer rate, plus uh, uh, 0.2 or 0.4%. Uh, and now, it, recently, they paid uh, LIBOR plus 1.65%, so a lot higher. If they are a bank holding company, they can, for example, acquire a bank and take in deposits and thereby reduce their uh, funding uh, cost. Uh, also, if they are a bank, uh, they basically qualify to get funds from uh, the government through the uh, uh, through TARP and the Troubled uh, Asset uh, Relief uh, Program. The main disadvantage for them is that now they are uh, going to be subject to a lot more regulatory oversight. They will be subject to capital requirements and also uh, regular um, um, oversight, um, uh, oversight uh, exams by the regulators. Okay, these were the things that I wanted to share with you. I'll now turn it over to Leonardo. <clears throat> so uh, I want to talk a little bit here about the, the, some consequences and uh, of the disposables. I think one consequence is that we're going to have a lot of data to dig to try to understand what happened. But uh, uh, another consequence that I think, if, let, let's pose this as, as a prediction, I think issues of corporate governance will come back full force in the next couple of years, and the SEC will have to take a stand on that. So I explain uh, what I mean by that. We start with uh, uh, executive, or sometimes excessive, executive compensation. Uh, and uh, last time we talked about this, on the last round table, people are still aghast that, so I have some members here, that Merrill Lynch had reserved $6.7 billion for 
uh, 2008 bonuses. And even the people from Lehman Brothers that went under would receive bonuses in 2008. And people said, what's going on? Right? This thing subsided a bit, but at least the, the, the top management, they're profiting of uh, this, like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, they're profiting the bonds for 2008. But then came the show of the outer industry with Congress. And um, uh, people asking them to, to for fee compensation, and they said, no, I'm fine. The other one said, no, I'm fine with that compensation. And, and people noticed that uh, Rick Wagner were, uh, uh, was finding out leaders of the audience as the company was going on in the last couple of years. So um, these are the other industries making this. And if you go uh, outside of that, if you go into the other companies as well, we have some numbers here, 2006, I think that's the last time we have this data, um, the average uh, top management person would have uh, a salary 364 three times the average salary, uh, the, the salary of the average US worker. That's in 2006. Uh, is this excessive? Probably so. You don't need to go back too much on time. If we go to 1980, the, the average CEO would get, the average top manager would get 42 times the salary of the average US worker, which might be still big, but why it went up so much in, in, in the last couple of years? Uh, this is executive compensation, right? But uh, there's a say by Bill Wine that said that, uh, uh, that excessive, uh, executive compensation or excessive compensation is the symptom that we corporate governance is the disease. Um, why so? Like the, the people who talk to me uh, the, the, the last years, I still remember my answer, they say, well, so they're paid too much, and I say, so what? You know, they're paid too much probably because they're deserved. They're private companies, they're private corporations, right? They decide what to do. And uh, if you're not happy with that, the guy, the guy or the person that's not paying the job, he's gonna, he or she is going to be sacked right, by the shareholders or by the board. The problem is that this thing is not so simple. Uh, and then when you think about what, how does it work, uh, the, 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 the private corporations in the West, is that well, you have the shareholders who ultimately own the company, and then you have the board of directors that act in between the shareholders and the management. And they're the ones that put the management there, and they're the ones that decide uh, how, uh, how the manager acts and whether they're going to sack the management. So uh, this brings the issue of corporate government. Corporate government is the set, uh, well, it's very difficult to, to, uh, uh, to define it, but let's say it's a set of rules and policies that determine how the company is managed and how management is controlled. Right. So you think, well, what's the story of that? Well, if the shareholder is not happy with the, the, the management uh, earnings 364 times the average U.S. work, so well, you, you decrease the salary, right? Uh, and, uh, and you do that to the board, right? You say, hey, I'm not happy with that. You have to, 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 to lower the salary of the manager. The point is that the interaction between the shareholders and the board, it's very, very complicated. And I'll give you a simple example. The issue about nomination. So we have the board, and ultimately the shareholders would determine who is part of the board. But still there is a rule, or there, so there is not a rule saying that the shareholders can nominate someone to be part of the board. Right? They can vote, right? but the nomination comes from the company itself. Right? There is a cost of the process that the shareholders can go through it. It's called a proxy contest. Right? But then the shareholder would come up with his own money, his, his or her own money, and then we decide, well, we're gonna put someone for an election, and then we have to identify all the shareholders of the company and send the, 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 uh, uh, the proxy or send the, the uh, information about, to have to campaign for that director. While the, share, the, the, the candidates from the company, they're funded by the company's funds. So it's very costly in practice. Uh, I don't know, but I think it seems that for the companies uh, uh, worth more than $200 million in the last, or well, not in the last, but from 1996 to 2004, there were only 17 cases where the board faced someone outside of the board in terms of the board. Uh, how many companies are worth more than $200 million? I don't know, let's say a thousand companies. A thousand companies, nine years, we'll talk about 9,000. Uh, potential case and only 17 situations that it is uh, actually happening. So, uh, why is that the case? Well, well, a little bit of a story. Uh, last time this was tried was 2003. There was a rule that said, well, if you have more than 5% ownership, which is huge, or 
those big corporations. So you can go and you can vote, and can, and can nominate, you know, can nominate someone for the board, and the company is going to be obliged to put that on, on, on the proxy materials. Uh, well, the proxy completely stalled. As you see, there was a lot of uh, opponents from the from, uh, business round table, from the company, said, well, let's forget about it. Yeah. Now they're trying again. Last year, 2007, they came up with two different proposals. Um, it's not a proposal to uh, nominate, but now it says that if you have five, uh, more than 5% ownership, you can uh, have a rule, you can vote for a rule, rule that would allow nomination by 5% ownership, you know? Uh, and even that, uh, as far as I know, uh, it's completely solved so far. Uh, and actually, it's 5%, but it cannot be an active investor. You have to be a passive investor. What does it mean that passive investment like pension funds, like they're holding, you, you, you acquire 5% of the ship a long time ago, and not last year, and not a hedge fund that is trying to, to top uh, the management of the company. Um, but the point is, why this thing is going to come back? Because my point, my answer to um, really my wife, you know, I was always uh, uh, concerned with, with this example of uh, <laughs> top management. Uh, but I said, well, they're private corporations, right? What changes them? What changes that? If you, if you think, if you have the government as uh, the backstop or the owner of last resort, so they're not exactly private corporations, right? So we have to really look at the situation when the management, well, they're just cashing. They're just cashing out the money, right? If the company goes out, so what? I rent with like hundred million dollars. So you know the, the right incentives are not there. So uh, the way, and it's I think in my opinion, it's very difficult for the government to say that you have you cannot pay more than such for uh, for a top management. But if shareholders are wiped out in some situations, you know, like the, in this reorganized bankruptcy, uh, the shareholders should have more of a say in, in how the company is managed. Okay? And it's not clear that it's going to pass. You know, and so at some point it becomes even politics where these things work. One big concern, big complaint says that, well, we don't want an activist. We don't want a shareholder to come there like the hedge funds. There is a, there is a, some case that hedge funds went to Zurich as well, this one case. But we don't want that pressure that would lead to short term. The sense that, well, I have to act for that shareholder. The shareholders won't look at the hedge funds. And they don't look at the next year, not for the long run. So I cannot make those long term decisions that would benefit the company. And the ultimate, uh, let's say, explanation why you should not have the shareholder more involved is that, well, it has worked so far, right? This is the, 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 the essence of, of, of American capitalism. Like Britain is different. Britain can vote. You have to vote more than 5% of vote. The shareholder and the, 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 the management usually listens to you, right? Even when you vote, you're a shareholder, and you vote some, for something on, on, on those uh, uh, proxy contests. The manager can do some work and say, well, I, like that's a, I think that's a good idea, but well, let's wait a little bit. It's not the case of it. So in the US, it has worked so far, right? But the risk is that, well, you're right. In the United States, they have this rule. The United States has been very successful in terms of the private corporations. But it might be confused with population and causation, right? Maybe what has happened, maybe what caused America to be so successful in private corporations. It's not this simple rule. And this thing, if, that means things would be even better if you have more participation of the shareholder. So I think my prediction is that I think, uh, not now because I think there are bigger problems going on right now, but I think this, at least this rule, and some others like majority vote, etc., they will come back and SEC will have to take a, a stronger stand than it has been doing in the last couple of years. Um, I'm Krishna from the Banking and Finance Department. Um, I don't really have a prepared speech or, or a speech on any topic, but uh, a lot of thoughts are swirling in my little head. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to articulate them as best as I can. And, and moreover, uh, Michael uh, introduced us as a, as a thought leader in this area. So that puts me under enormous pressure to <laughs> uh, give you some thoughts. And if there are some questions on these thoughts, then uh, Peter Richkin will answer those. <laughs> um, so, um, 
So these, uh, I don't claim that these are new thoughts, uh, but perhaps they are, or at least they are provocative thoughts. Um, so this whole thing of uh, derivatives and the regulation and the mess uh, that we are in, uh, one could al almost look at it as a design problem. So people, very clever people uh, like Peter, have uh, designed these derivatives, um, come up with this out-of-the-box solution in some sense. Uh, and the main, uh, the importance of derivatives, as Peter explained, was in risk sharing. Okay, so if you want to get the best pricing of a risky product, then there are a group of individuals who can best bear that risk and give you the best pricing. So derivatives allow you to share the risk or spread the risk around. And derivatives also allow for price discovery or uh, making the markets more efficient. For instance, uh, you can look at the credit default spread, as Peter mentioned. And that's, in some sense, uh, the, uh, an estimate of the risk being taken by that firm at any point in time. So it leads to better price discovery. One can argue that bonds do the same thing, but there's been a lot of research that uh, credit spreads in the bonds are colored by other things like taxation and so on. Uh, so that is how uh, derivatives uh, came about. Mm -hmm. But uh, it also led us to this mess. So to get out of this mess, once again, we need to probably think innovatively. And it's again a design problem, so think outside the box. Uh, so it's a, I have a lot of thoughts, so I'm not sure if I can articulate this as well as I can, if I prefer. So let me try. The first is, the basic problem is the problem of asymmetric information. So the originators or the firms know more about the future prospects of their products than the outside investors. Okay, so that is the basic problem of asymmetric information. So um, how do we make the markets better? How do we protect the outside investors so that they can make better informed decisions? You can do it in two ways. One is through regulation. Okay, I'll talk briefly about that. And the second is the role played by certifier companies. Okay, so who are the certifiers? So if you have uh, been investing in the markets uh, for quite some time, then you would know that 1999 and 2000 was a tech bubble. Okay. So if you were lucky enough to receive subscription of a tech IPO in those years, then on the first day itself, when the trading begins, you can make 30, 40, 50 percent returns. Okay. So who received those tech IPO uh, allocations, apart from big buy side clients like Fidelity, who can always arm twist uh, the investment banks to give them allocation because they're always there in the long run as the big uh, clients. Who are the individuals? So some work was done by Elliot Spitzer in his previous incarnation. So he was also <laughs> famous there. Uh, he was looking at uh, who got these allocations and then they came to light some one practice called spinning. In that practice, and, and you might have heard about CSFP and uh, Frank Patron, who was dragged through this litigation and finally he was not indicted. Uh, so he was managing the tech IPO business that Credit Suisse was costing. And they looked at who he gave uh, allocations of these hot IPOs which were guaranteed in those years to make money. And it turns out that those were CEOs of future clients of CSFP. Okay, so I have a train of thought here, so please follow me. Uh, so what is the problem here? The problem of spending is investment banks want to maximize their revenues by catering to their future clients. Okay. So likewise, you know the story about Arthur Anderson and how they catered to Enron and finally went down uh, because of Enron and shredding documents and so on, uh, which actually led to uh, the regulation called the Sarbanes Oxley Act that you are maybe familiar with. So Sarbox was basically a regulatory step to take the place of certifiers who are the auditors, okay, in some sense. So in this mess, who are the certifiers? The certifiers are the rating agencies. So did the rating agencies do their job? So Peter was very 
optimistic about their role. And they have done a good job over a long period of time, but it is easy to do a good job when the times are good, right? Because the house prices are going up. Even if you rated a pool of CDOs or CDO squares, nobody can disprove that they were not AAA until the bad times hit. And then you heard about the Waxman Committee uh, hearings, uh, the Congressional Committee hearings uh, on these rating agencies. And then you come, uh, some email trail came into light uh, where some guy at SNP Standard & Poor has said that cows could have structured this product and we are still getting there. Okay? So did they do the due diligence? That's my question. Okay? So we have, uh, so I gave you some examples of the failure of rating agencies. And recently, Moody's have suddenly switched from AAA to C. Okay, how did that happen? Did you know that defaults would be correlated? Did you not predict, a, a, did you not have a model in such situations, as Peter mentioned, where the defaults could be correlated and not independent? Isn't it their job to make sure that you're giving, taking into account even the worst case scenario, something like value at risk? Uh, and, and so, the, the point here is, uh, who pays these certifiers? Okay, so the investment banks are paid by uh, their clients, the, the, the firms that want to uh, issue securities to the market. The auditors are paid by Enron, uh, it's a, uh, or the, the clients they are uh, auditing. The standard and poor or the rating agencies are paid by uh, the, the, the firms whose products they are rating. So an out-of-the-box way of thinking is, uh, can we save the role of certifiers by changing their incentive contracts so that they are paid by the clients who are going to suffer if they, if they didn't perform their due diligence properly? Okay, so I don't know the solution to that, but that would be an out-of-the-box way of thinking about these things. Okay. The second uh, issue is, so that is one, incentive contracts and the role of certifiers. Uh, the second issue is uh, 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 there is a, so let me back off before I address the second issue. So there is a strict priority rule in, in, in security issuances. And you'll be all familiar with this, that the senior bondholders get paid first, then the juniors, the coordinated debt holders, and then finally the equity holders. Okay? So the equity holders are the financials of the last resort, so there is a loss and they bear on the loss. And so there is a priority, or there is a pecking order of uh, priority of who gets paid first. But in such a situation like this, would it not make sense? So let's take GM for example. So you've got uh, debt holders of GM, you've got equity holders, and more importantly, you have underperforming CEOs. Okay? So uh, uh, I'm not sure of these numbers, but Rick Wagner, uh, even before the security crisis hit, uh, under his watch, GM lost value of around $50 billion even before the security crisis or the economic crisis hit. And during that, another $25 billion. Or $20 billion. Okay. Uh, you heard about Merrill Lynch's uh, Tain asking for $10 million bonus right now. Why? Not because he performed, but because if he didn't uh, do his job, they would have performed even worse. So this is the lesser of the EU. And so he must be paid $10 million. So the CEOs made out like bandits, okay, over the last five, six years. So is that the case that can be made that when people come together to renegotiate uh, bankruptcy, or this is called fast track bankruptcy, or prepackaged bankruptcy, then would it not make sense for all these groups of uh, stakeholders in a firm to all take a haircut? The CEOs should give back some money that they have expropriated over the last few years when, when the going was good. Okay, for instance, uh, Dick Fall has a huge lavish office with a shower, a huge library, expensive chairs, and so on in his uh, office, and we ran it to the ground. So the, the CEOs who got paid, should they not give back? The bondholders were the first priority. Should they not take a haircut? Why should uh, the taxpayers bear the entire brand? Why should uninformed or misinformed or misled equity shareholders take the entire hit of these stakeholders? Okay. 
Okay, so that is thought two. Okay, so let me re recap thought one is the role of certifiers and completely rethinking their incentive schemes. Thought two is some sort of uh, prepackaged bankruptcy proceedings where everybody takes a haircut, including those who have been paid before. Okay? I can see a lot of legal uh, uh, obstacles to this, uh, and there are also other obstacles, for instance, if you uh, decide, if, even if the Supreme Court allows this, and you decide to take back some of the pay that you already received, even that, if that were possible, then in the future would the bright minds go to these jobs because there is always the risk now now that the precedence has been established that I pay you today and take it back tomorrow. Okay? Uh, but that is also the issue with TARP, the way it is structured. So one of the executive compensation uh, rules in the TARP uh, was that we will lend you money but if you underperform in the future there is a clawback provision where we will revoke the bonus and take back some money. That again leads to the same problem. You won't attract the best minds if there is always the danger that I won't get paid. That's why Kane wants 10 million because he knows he's good. Okay? So the banks would find another way to compensate that maybe if they use signing bills. Okay? And the third thing, thought is regulation. So uh, Krishna mentioned the glass steagle Act. So Glass-Steagall's Act separated commercial banking from investment banking. Obviously, for the world, has a problem that commercial bank lends out a loan, holds its subprime, and then asks the investment banks to sell securities so that the subprime risk is now borne by uh, uninformed outside investors. Okay? So precisely for that reason, there should be a Chinese wall. But the Grand Leach Flyley Act that Krista mentioned revoked that. And who, who was instrumental for that? Sandy Wild of, of City Corp. Who else was responsible for City Corp? And many say, I'm not sure, I'm not making this allegation, but Rubin, right, who said that this should, that these derivative securities should not be regulated as much and let them take more risk. Okay, so once again, it's the same thing. When the going is good, these guys got $150 million bonuses. Okay? But what the regulation did, Grand leach Pliley Act, was it created monsters. So Citigroup became insurance, commercial banking, and investment banking. So it's too big to fail. In some sense, they wanted it to be too big to fail. And they would be willing to pay a price to be too big to fail, because then they are protected against bankruptcy. Okay? And there is a lot of studies in corporate finance which says, that spin-offs are actually good, create value. So why should regulation encourage too big to fail? Okay, we should rethink regulation and then make the companies probably not too big to fail. So those were my three thoughts. Um, so if there are any questions, please address them. You know, we're, we're sort of short on time. Maybe what we can do is open up to any questions folks have about anything we've talked about today or anything we haven't talked about today. Yeah. Um, everything that you say seems to always revolve around debt. And so my question is, uh, I read recently that you know the debt in this country, government, corporate, uh, consumer, is something like 3.5 times GDP, up from 2.2 back in 2000. How much debt can we tolerate? And to move this country forward, how much do we have to reduce before we can actually get back to a sense of prosperity and stability. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough question to answer, and let me make it even tougher still. Okay. So, uh, uh, most of, as, as Peter was saying, that most of the debt is subscribed, uh, uh, not most, a large part of the, of the U.S. debt is subscribed by, uh, by outside parties, international countries, China, for instance. And um, uh, we, we led to that situation in the sense that they could invest in the Fannie Mae and the Freddie Mac debt because there was an implicit guarantee that it is like Treasury security. So they, they were, nobody expected that, that they would be get, getting paid. So it has just exploded. And uh, uh, 
in the near future, it's even harder to see how the taxpayers uh, would be involved in financing this because I'm sure at least in the next few years that there would be tax cuts rather than tax increases of any sort. So there will be both corporate tax cuts as well as individual tax cuts. So the answer to this question is it suggests an enormous mess with no end in sight. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see this with anybody else. Uh, with the, with the uh, yes, to some, to, some, to some extent, you can compare you know, the US to like, I don't know, a single consumer with too many credit cards, <coughs> right? And when, when the economy is, is, is doing well, it's not a problem to use many credit cards because you know that you, you know, at some point you'll be able to uh, pay uh, things off. But then when the going, get, going gets tough, uh, like now, it's like, whoa, all at once, you know, the financiers, like from abroad, they're also less willing to basically um, provide us with additional debt financing. And we should start, you know, paying off some of our debts because we just have uh, too much. So we should get rid of some of the credit cards. But then the other question is, you know, how, how many credit cards should we get rid of? Well, the, the problem they take care of itself is debt gets flushed out of the system personal and corporate bankers is get flushed out. JP, what were you well, the underlying risk is whatever the underlying risk is in the economy. You know, it's the sort of business thing. And, and the financial risk laid on top of it is just a way to split up the pie in different parts. It's the contamination of one to the other. So when we have the financial risk, we don't really care among consuming adults how they've managed to split up risk as long as it doesn't affect real activity. But now we're affecting real activity by jobs. That's the problem. And so the question is, what have we done structurally to encourage this that then has this contagion effect? And part of it is the stuff you guys have talked about, you know, the systematic biases we've built in. The other one that hadn't been mentioned that Peter and I were talking about the last week or so is the deductibility of debt interest. We systematically <coughs> underprice debt by subsidizing it through the tax system as opposed to equity. So we basically not only screwed up the risk side by taking the moral hazard and all that stuff. We made it less risky than it should be, in some sense. We also made it cheaper than it should be. Is it surprising that we went drunk on debt? Everybody, particularly the corporate side, not the individual so much. So one solution would be reduce, the, you know, eliminate the tax deductibility from corporations of debt, the interest rate, and reduce the tax rate to compensate that so that the net tax is, is the same or even less, but get rid of the bias towards debt. Because we clearly have a bias towards debt, which leads to some of this stuff in a very nasty way. Now that's radical. That'll help us a lot of people. <laughs> Questions about um, So we've heard a lot of comments in terms of, well, we know already how severe this problem is. And we've heard a lot of comments from the market that, you know, we're going to see you know, we're going to come back mid-09 or even later on in 2010. What, what, is, what are your guys' take on in terms of, okay, we have this severe problem. You know, what time frame? I know we don't have a crystal ball, but what's your time frame that we actually can see an end in this problem? I can't give you an example yes. from, from uh, one CEO that some of us were just with uh, from U.S. Bank. Uh, and someone raised the issue that this looked to be a 24-month problem. He said, if this is a 24-month problem, we'll all be popping champagne corks. Yeah. So uh, that'll give you some idea that, that he, he expected it to be more like a, a three- or five-year problem. Anybody else want to take a crack at that? Peter? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have any supervision. I really don't know, but I, I would say the stock market has really absorbed a lot, and the, the market probably is going to be a little flat here on out for, and very volatile for a long period of time. It's a problem of Main Street and Wall Street. So if your question deals with uh, how long would this crisis uh, continue on the Main Street, that would be longer than uh, how much it would be reflected in stock prices, for instance, because stock price is forward-looking and has hopefully priced in most of the expected uh, pain uh, we could take. Yeah. 
Cindy? When you, when you kicked off this program, you read a very discouraging article. But Peter said, now there's going to be some good news. So I'd like to know what the good news is. <laughs> I think the charts you're, you're talking about are the default, you know, sort of by vintage mortgage years, where the defaults are. I mean, this, you know, this this new program, we can have uh, old. You know, I mean, just think about in our neighborhoods here in Cleveland, Ohio. I mean, I, I know the houses that have been for sale in my neighborhood haven't been moving. You know, inventories are just enormous. And you know, the thought is this new eight hundred billion dollars that's really going to stimulate low interest rates. Interest rates come down, credit's available. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to step in and buy these houses and hopefully, you know, stabilize um, you know, the housing market. But, but the problem is, my point is, is, is yeah. are we still giving loans to, to people that just breathe? Yeah. No, no, no. That's no. What I, want to hear I think that affects on the prime issues. loans. I don't think that's supposed to affect much of the supply. Now, I don't see a bank, if they cannot distribute, uh, I don't see any bank uh, related to a supply. The opposite effect has occurred. There's good credit risks now that are not able to access credit markets. It's the exact opposite. It's an overreaction. Take right. one more question. Yes. Small business over the next couple of years, ability to start up, ability to sustain, just general dominance. Well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of it depends on what kind of small business. Um, you know, there's still a lot of capital, venture capital, out there. It's just, I mean, if you take a look at, at, at venture capital, where they put money in five years ago, you know, where's the liquidity get out of those deals? It's selling companies are taking it public. Why aren't they selling companies for smaller companies? And uh, there's, there's markets, markets dried up. So, um, there's always, yeah, there's always entrepreneurs. And there is some some capital, some equity capital available, but um, you know you have to have a fundamental business plan that works in a down economy. Look, I, I want to wrap it up here, but before I do, um, I want to thank uh, all of our faculty uh, members for being here today. They all gave freely of their time. They all donated their time to be here uh, to share their thoughts with you, the community. So I want to thank. You. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. Please come back and visit us again, and uh, take care.